Hello, everyone, and welcome to Classical Revolution here on iDagio. My name is Rachel Finlon, and this is my weekly series in which I chat with guests in the classical music world about what pushing boundaries is in classical music or what risk taking feels like. Today, I'm joined by harpsichordist Mahan Esfahani. A real pioneer of the instrument, Mahan performs regularly in the major concert halls, festivals, and also concerti with a lot of the major orchestras. He's a recording artist with Deutsche Grammophon and Hyperion with an extensive discography. Uh, Mahan is really celebrated for his championing of the instrument and the kind of evolution of the harpsichord. He commissions composers regularly, and he's truly one of these musicians who's at home in Bach and then Ligeti or Sorensen, Lewis, Luke Ferrari, for example. Um, I'm really thrilled to welcome him on the show today. So please welcome Mahan Esfahani. Hi, Mahan. Hi, how's it, how's it going there? Good, how's it going there? <laughs> Okay, I just had a curry, so I'm in a very good mood. Oh, that sounds nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mahan, I, I usually like to begin by asking um, what your earliest introductions to music were and whether there were any particular musical moments or memories that jump out to you that were kind of formative for you as a musician. I suspect a lot of um, musicians who answer this question will say that their first memories of music are their family playing music. And that's the same for me. My father was a musician. Um, so of course, I don't, I, I don't remember him not playing music, frankly. Uh, I mean, he was always playing piano. He played the guitar. He sang. He actually was um, a rock musician. Um, and he played in a lot of studio bands and things like that. And, but there was always classical music in the house. So, you know, listening to recorded music or to hear him play and sing, you know, inevitably I thought, well, I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to do that. Um, so I guess you learn how to walk and you learn how to talk and you learn music. So I don't, I don't remember when there wasn't music. Okay. And what was um, your path particularly to the harpsichord? <laughs> well, you know, the piano, of course. I mean, who, you know, everyone starts right. on the piano. There's occasionally there's some kids who say, oh, I started on the harpsichord. And I'm like, that's good. That's like kind of weird. You know, it's kind of like starting on the viola da gamba, but not the cello. Like, I, I guess that's possible. But no, look, most of us came um, through the piano. But, you know, Rachel, in that sense, many players of many instruments came to music through the piano or through, or through, or through singing, right? And um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's funny, um, uh, Deutsche Grammophon recently released a box of um, many of the recordings of Carl Richter, who was a harpsichordist, organist, conductor. And um, as it happens, my first recording that I heard of the harpsichord was of Carl Richter playing the harpsichord. It was on a cassette tape. Remember those? And uh, you're probably too young for it. No, I remember tapes. them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I heard it and I thought, first of all, the, the first thing I thought to myself, I was like eight, I guess, or nine. And I thought, this must be several instruments. Like, what are these magical instruments all playing together at the same time? And when I found out it was one instrument, I said, right, that's what I'm gonna play. That's how I wanna play that. And that, that's how I wanna play it. And that, that's what I'm gonna do. And so, you know, I just played piano for many years. And, but I think fundamentally, um, you know, the sound of an instrument or, or a voice is like, um, it's like a flavor. You know, it's like a taste. I think once you taste that thing, you're always going to look for that. Um, you're always going to look for that flavor. You're always going to look for that taste. And so, you know, once it grabbed me the harpsichord, I thought, okay, I've got to, I've got to get my hands on one. I've got to, I've got to listen to one. You know, and I think, um, uh, you know, fundamentally, if you if you like on a visceral level what you do, you'll you'll find out a way to do it. I always. I thought that the best thing I could do with my life was like get the job where someday I could like travel to Europe and hear a harpsichord. Like I didn't ever think that I was going to be a harpsichordist. Um, so in a sense, becoming a harpsichordist was just like cheating. You know, it was like, hey, now I get to spend all of my time with the right. thing that I wanted to listen to anyway. Right. Love it. 
Um, you're, you're sort of seen as a radicalist when it comes ah, to the instrument sorry. itself. I mean, like just oh. diving, into, <laughs> diving into your work and, uh. and reading a lot of your, um, even the presentations you've yourself done on BBC, for example, um, when you, you sort of break down these preconceptions about the harpsichord as an instrument. Um, and I'm curious to hear from you firsthand what some of those preconceptions of the harpsichord are and why you think that they exist? Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, uh, I was talking to a, 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 a journalist friend. Yes, it's possible to be friends with journalists. Um, and <laughs> She was, she was saying like, hey, you know, why do you, why do you feel a need to address misconceptions? I mean, you know, I just see you as a musician first and it's not important what the medium is. Yeah, true, right? Like we should all be so lucky to, to be seen as musicians. But I sometimes wonder whether um, people's preconceptions or misconceptions, I think is a better mm -hmm. word, that they, they might um, result in people not listening to what you have to say. Right. So um, I sometimes because I'm a nerd, I watch on YouTube. I watch these old videos of like parliamentary debate from the from the from the commons from like the 70s and the 60s and stuff like that. And if you look at, for example, when the first women were in parliament, men made fun of them. Right. Them being women meant that people didn't listen to what they had to say in, in parliament. That's a very extreme example. Um, but, you know, when, when you play the harpsichord, and I think, you know, I've been in Europe for 15 years, so fundamentally you're dealing with, a, I think, a much more, um, you know, dare I say, a much more developed culture. But um, certainly in the United States, where I grew up, the notion was, you know, people say all sorts of basically asinine, can I say asinine and I day show? Yeah. Um, people say all kinds of asinine things about the harpsichord, and, it, and it's always like this barrier to them just listening to the musician. Yeah. And so the issue is if you want to be heard, then you have to ask for equality for you and, mm -hmm. and for your medium, you know, and for your voice and for your face and for, and for your name and for whatever. And so, you know, fundamentally, yeah, like fundamentally dealing with the misconceptions is a bit self-serving self on my part because I, I just want to be heard. I just want to, I just want what I have to say to, to be heard, um, you know, with uh, with e with equity, maybe that's that's a, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, and what are, what are some of your approaches to sort of breaking down those like guards or those barriers in people? Like, what has that that experience been like? Well, look, I mean, it's got to be a concert first and a museum exhibit second, right? Okay. Um, the issue is is that when the music was written. For instance, music from the Fitzwilliam Virginal book, which is around 16, 1610 mm -hmm. or so. Uh, this is quite early music. It's not the earliest music, but it's quite early music. And uh, you know, there's a there's a time at which that music was one day old, right? There's a time at which that music was fresh. There's a time at which that music, um, you know, it, it, the best music uh, represents trends and ambitions which may be in fact ahead of the curve in terms of what's going on in music at the time. Not all music, but very good music tends to do that. Um, and by the way, there's music that's also, um, you know, very much representative of the trends of its time. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but, uh, you know, there was a composer I was working with and he said, um, I said to him, oh, this passage that you've written is very difficult. And he said, well, you know, I want it to sound as though it's at the edge of what it can do. And so maybe there was a point at which a piece by William Byrd, by Thomas Hopkins, by Farnaby, by, you know, Froberger, whomever, um, there's, a, there's a time at which that was stretching the boundaries, you know? Mm -hmm. And so how did people listen to it? With what ears did they listen to it? You know, how was it fresh, um, fresh for them? Also, you know, all, I don't want to get into this, but there's plenty of evidence that, you know, we don't even listen with the same ears that our grandparents had, you know? So how do we claim to understand how they listened to music back then? I, I, don't, think we, I don't think we reasonably can uh, understand how they listen to music. But what what does remain, and I think one of the great gifts of Western music is that we developed a system of notation, it ain't perfect, but we developed a system of notation wherein the inner world of a creator can be transmitted through that system of notation. And when you play from that notation, you can, to some extent, 
enter the inner world of that human being. That's very deep. That's very, very, that's a great achievement. And so, you know, I think to be disarming is means just being direct. You know, our audiences are smart people. You know, um, I don't have kids, but I just had a, fr a friend over we, we had dinner with and um, he has kids. And I see him with his, his kids are under the age of 10. He talks to them like adults, you know, don't baby talk to kids, talk to them like equals and they will, they will act, they will behave properly, you know? And so in a sense, don't talk down to your audience. Don't baby talk to your audience. But also, you know, I don't give the audience, I don't say to the audience, you know, this, what I'm giving you has validity because it's old. You know, like either you're gonna like it or you're not gonna like it. Also, I mean, playing modern music shows, hey, this instrument still has a lot to say. And I think that that might disarm people who have the notion that, um, you know, old music is kind of dead or kind of dusty. Uh, and I think, Rachel, you know, that goes for, um, that goes for any ancient or time honored endeavor. There's, there's still something living within it. Mm -hmm. um, that's why we still, you know, grow food in our own plots. That's why we, you know, make our own, you know, yogurt at home. I don't know, like things that our, that our ancestors did because there is a, each of these things, there is a strong aesthetic and emotional connection to our forebears, which is deeply, which is deeply precious. And mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I think, you know, just, just being yourself disarms most people, except for people who hate you, obviously. Um, but that's not my problem. Nope. Um, when you're commissioning composers, what are you looking for? I mean, how do you want to push either the musical sort of either, yeah, either the music itself or the instrument? What are you, like, what are the things that you look for when you're commissioning? You know, the truth is, I mean, I don't interfere too much. Although, I mean, a couple of composers will tell you that I interfere, but I don't interfere. Um, I think that if it's a composer who has something to say, then I basically trust them for what they're gonna do. Let me be more specific here. Um, Gavin Bryars wrote a piece which I recorded, um, which is after Handel's Vesper. It has nothing to do with Handel, but um, it was not written for me, sadly, but I do play it a lot and I, and I did record it. And like on, um, like on the face of it, this piece does not push the harpsichord technically. It actually looks, I don't know if you know Gavin Bryars' other music, but it, it looks actually pretty straightforward notationally. It looks, it looks even disarmingly simple. But what he, Gavin's music overall has this inner power that becomes apparent only after you've learned the notes and then you kind of draw the expression out of the notes. Um, that's very different from a composer like say, um, Francisco Cole is a um, Spanish composer who lives in Switzerland, wonderful composer, wrote me a concerto. And Francisco pushes the instrument to places where it's uh, may, it's like, I, like, really, you expect me to do that? And he, and he does. And where someone like Miroslav Srinka, who I've commissioned a concerto from, which I'm supposed to do with Gertzenich Orchestra next season because of, because of Corona, it was moved. And um, so, you know, Mirek has a different way of handling the harpsichord. Um, ben Sorensen, his concerto is just behind me right here. And, um, you know, the way he does it is that it's very disarming. You think he's using kind of time-honored techniques, but the more you go into what he's done, you, you see that he has a very novel take on, on everything. So I think, you know, uh, you know, cometh the moment, cometh the composer. Uh, you know, what the instrument and what the music needs at that time, there is a composer who can provide that. And I, and I, and I, and I would say this, Rachel, you know, for, for anyone who's commissioning, uh, a lot of a lot of young musicians ask me, "How do you get about commissioning, and how do you commission?" And I say, "Well, you know, you should even commission stuff that you might not really um, feel is congenial to you, because you're also we have a responsibility to create a corpus and a repertoire mm. for the future, right? Mm. And you know, some people like minimalism, some don't. You know, some people like like super post tonal stuff, some don't. Some people like harsh noise, some people don't." You know, as opposed to commissioning things that only I like, mm -hmm. that I'm not gonna say, and I'm not gonna say what I like or I don't like, <laughs> but like, you know, if I were only to do that, I think it would be depriving us of something. Having said that, everything that I've commissioned, I like. Um, <laughs> because the, you know, the, the pain in the neck of learning it by the end, how could you not like it? Um, so maybe, I don't know, maybe I've been lucky. But. 
I love that. I, I, I love what you say that we're, we're also contributing to a canon for the future of, of, the, of the instrument, of the tradition, of the genre, I think. I really love that. We it's are, we, we are, because we're very privileged in what we do. You gotta, yeah. and you, you gotta give back with yeah. repertoire. If you yeah. like, I don't mean to get all, what, you know, judgmental about this, but if you're just sitting on old repertoire and you're totally not interested in looking forward, like I, there are better things to do with your time. You know, I just, at least there are better things for me to do with my time, so. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously, it's something that we talk a, a lot about on the show because the evolution of this of this art form of this classical music genre it doesn't evolve without new music so it just doesn't yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it never and it never did and it no. never did exactly yeah. yeah and it's it's on us uh, performers to do that so mm -hmm. no but that's that's an interesting idea to also challenge yourself with your own aesthetics i, I really like that it's a pain in the neck don't get me wrong yeah but, you know <laughs> <laughs> um, you've, you've done uh, quite a bit of presenting as well. Um, and I, I listened to a couple of your BBC radio three segments were truly interesting. And, and one of them really piqued my interest, which was this segment about the other Iran. Um, and you talk about just sort of this cultural divide that happened when there was a divide um, at the border uh, in, in the uh, 19th century and sort of which shaped different musical cultures. And I just wanted to ask you about that and maybe it would be interesting for our audience to hear what kind of, pers like what perspectives did you gain from that research or from that, um, from that particular- from, from that project. Yeah, from that project. Yeah, I, I know what you're getting at. I mean, um, okay, so this, this project was, uh, so, you know, Iran, the, the nation of Iran now is the, last sort of remainder of what was the what was the Persian Empire, which at various points in the last 3,000 years was a very big empire. Mm -hmm. And um, in the 19th century, you know, you have the kind of final end to that empire because, you know, Russia, you know, Russia goes up, Persia goes down. And um, so uh, th there were a series of wars in the early 19th century and Russia took over a good part of the Northern Persian empire, which included what is today um, Georgia, Republic of Armenia and Azerbaijan, also Dagestan and Chechnya and stuff, but I don't wanna, I wanna get into that. And so what happened was that part of Azer, like what, what we call Azerbaijan was left in what is now Iran. And the other half of Azerbaijan became, like became part of the Russian empire and then eventually became the Soviet Republic of Azerbaijan and then be, eventually became the Republic of Azerbaijan. So, but the, the people on these two sides of the border are the same people. Okay, so, and again, I don't wanna get into the details about that because it's very contentious, but I mean, they are fundamentally an Iranian people who speak a Turkish language. Someone's gonna write a nasty comment to me about that. It is what it is. But um, so, so they're all Azeris, but some are Iranian Azeris and some are Azeri Azeris, I guess you'd say. And, but what was interesting is that the one that had the Russian empire, the Russian and then the Soviet empire developed, um, you know, symphony orchestras, opera houses, um, women were allowed, you know, because Iran, Persia is a Muslim country. So women were allowed to sing in opera, like, you know, fundamentally the, the um, hold of the religion um, mm -hmm. was weakened in Russian Azerbaijan. And um, so if you look at Azerbaijan today, I've actually on Facebook live, I've been watching the National Theater of Baku's um, like operas from this past month, which have been amazing. They've done awesome stuff. And whereas in Iran, like none of that happened basically, right? And right. so the fundamental, um, you know, embedded provocation, if you like, of my project, which I feel like nobody really got, um, was to say that, you know, all peoples are capable of all things, mm -hmm. um, you know, I went to Baku and I saw people who look like me performing Puccini, right? Performing Rachmaninoff, performing Tchaikovsky, performing Bach, performing whatever. And so, you know, it's if you culturally allow people to do what they want to do, they're going to do it. And Iran is an example of a country that didn't allow people to get on with it. And Azerbaijan is an example of, of, of a country that at least culturally speaking, cultivated people's you know, creative mm -hmm. urges to participate in the international project of classical music. And I, and I do want to say classical music, um, which is to say Western classical music is an international endeavor, 
you know? I mean, we have Western style classical music written by people in all cultures, written, written you know, by, by, you know, people of all gender identities, people of all colors, people of whatever. And if you restrict that canon, then you cannot make a reasonable uh, assertion that this is an international movement. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. by going to Azerbaijan, I wanted to show that, you know, this thing is this thing is actually really big. By the way, what I really mm -hmm. wanted to do for Radio 3 was to go to China and make a several part series about the, about the history of orchestras in China, which starts in the 19th century. But we're going to have to wait until all this stuff is over. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, look, uh, I make these programs for, for the BBC. Um, and I have some stuff coming up, hopefully for Radio 4 and World Service mm -hmm. and stuff. I do these programs because I don't get to think about this stuff as a harpsichordist. So why not think about it in a documentary, right? Like the documentaries for me basically are a way of doing the stuff that I don't get to do otherwise. Yeah. And I think, oh, I'm really curious about something. Like, I don't know anything about Azerbaijan. So, hey, I'll just tell, I'll just tell the BBC that, hey, let's do a documentary about it and I'll do the research and, and I'll present it. So um, that's, that's kind of the, the reason why those happen. It's, it, yeah, it's really great. I mean, of course, also, yeah, you don't question those things every day as a harpsichordist, but to be an artist, you have to have that kind of global awareness of what's relevant. Of, and, of course, yeah. of, of course you do. And, and oh, look, it's amazing. I mean, I get some things out of it too. I mean, I met a couple of cool Azari composers who all commissioned. By the way, did you know that, that, that the leading internationally famous Azari composer who already had quite a career in the Soviet Union is Farangiz Alizade, woman composer. It's the only Muslim country where the head of the Union of Composers is a woman. Okay, wow. and she is awesome, by the way. She's published by Shot. I want to say, like, probably the publishers will get angry at me if I get it wrong. I think she's published by Shot, and like, I'm totally going to commission her, you know, like, that's totally going to happen. So, hey, jackpot for me, like, get to learn some stuff and maybe get a new piece out of it. So, you know, win win. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, something that I, I def um, like talking about on the show also is sort of just the general idea of the role of classical music in society and our, like what our kind of job is to shape that role. Um, and I think you're in a particularly interesting um, situation because you've lived in, now you're living in Prague now, but you've also lived in the UK and the US. And so you've seen probably many different ways of, of the treatment of classical music in, in, within a culture. Um, and I would just, yeah, I would be curious to hear your thoughts on that on how you feel or view that role of classical music in that society. Is a, that is a toughie. I yeah. mean, look, here's, here's what I think. Um, I think that by doing something true, and I don't think classical music is the only thing that's true. I think many kinds of music have truth and you know beauty and that sort of thing in them. Uh, doing something true is already a sign to other humans that there's good out there that is worth fighting for and worth living for. Um, I think that is sufficient. Uh, I mean, in a sense, classical, you know, not just classical music, art, literature, um, these endeavors are what they are because they are not useful. These are not useful things mm -hmm. in, in the sense of they, they, they don't have utility. Mm -hmm. um, I must confess to you, I am not very well disposed toward in a tendency uh, on the part of some classical musicians to use the stage as a platform for what they feel at the moment are worthy political or social causes. That's not to say that I'm not sympathetic to those causes. I'm very much sympathetic to the cause of right and whatever is right. But if you do that, it leaves us musicians with very little defense for when a tyrannical regime will come and do the same thing. You know, there was a time, there have been times in history where a tyrannical regime 
said, you know, Wagner, Beethoven, even Handel and Bach are, you know, paragons of a superior race, right? Of a superior life, of a superior people, of a people who have a right to get rid of some other people of, you know, and we know how that went in history, right? So um, it's happened before. So if we take Beethoven or we take Bach and we say, oh, you know, they, they stand, I just learned that word on Twitter, they stand for, you know, for this progressive cause, for this worthy thing, for this, uh, I don't know, say multinational free trading block or whatever have you. Uh, that's great and I'm all for those things. But the second you do that, uh, you know, you forget that, well, yeah, if, if, Be if, if Beethoven or Bach wanted to stand for worthy causes, they knew how to do it. I mean, Beethoven knew how to do it. He would just write his opinions. He didn't need to do with music. Um, and, you know, you, I think we rob ourselves of the understanding that music and, and, and art for that matter, um, without words, offers that which humans need. Um, and I don't think it needs to be in words. I mean, there's a film, there's a Czech film from uh, the 1960s, from the Czech New Wave uh, by Miloš Forman. And uh, it's called Horji Mapanenko, which means uh, it's the English title usually is The Fireman's Ball. And The Fireman's Ball was very, very controversial when it was made and it was, and it was banned by the, by the communist government. Um, it's, guess what it's about? It's about a fireman's ball. It's about a village, bunch of village bitch firemen who have a ball, that's it. And like, but it was, it was considered at the time that there were certain messages in it that were anti-regime. When Milos Forman was asked about this, and I'm probably gonna garble this and misremember it, but when Milos Forman was asked about this film, he said, I didn't put any of those things in the film. However, if there are things in our society which are wrong, perhaps they're on your mind that, that things in my film made you think about them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if someone hears a work by Bach or Beethoven or I don't care, whatever, Telemann or Wolfgang Riem or Saria yeah. or whatever, if there's something that's wrong in society or in our world, you better believe someone's gonna think of that listening to a beautiful piece of music or looking at a piece of art or watching a film, yeah. okay? But the second you get up there and you go, Bach stands yeah. for for, I don't know, for Iranians like me, like, no, dude, that's not, that's like, Bach would be like, Dummkopf, what are you doing? You know, so I don't, I'm not down, that's just not my vibe at all. Um, it, you, and, but I just want to be clear, it used to be, like, I used to kind of do that, and I, and seeing others do it kind of um, made me sick to my stomach, so I've stopped doing it. And I think, and I think it's, uh, I think it's tasteless, and I think it's, and I think it's deeply self-serving. That's what I think. And I think this point that you bring up also about um, the utility or lack thereof of music. I mean, we kind of, we do, we rob it of that if we try to um, kind of speak on its behalf or put it in certain. So I think that, yeah, that's. Um, I like that point a lot. Um, and yeah, um, you know, we're speaking mid pandemic with a um, million uncertainties and something I certainly am asking myself and, and asking my guests is like how you feel, how you might question yourself differently as an artist out of this crisis. Um, how, like, what do you feel has, ha, have certain things changed in you, certain perspectives or philosophies? I mean, I was, you know, I'm always questioning myself as an artist. To be an artist, I mean, I'm not a real artist now. I'm not a composer. I mean, a composer is an artist. You know, I'm just a performer. Um, but, you know, I'm always questioning myself. I mean, to be in my head is to be in a, you know, deeply self-questioning place with questionable self-esteem. Uh, so that's for sure. Um, but I would say, you know, <laughs> I think you you don't sweat the little things anymore. You're thrilled to be out there. You know, the, the few concerts that I have had or the streams or, you know, or nice or nice conversations like this or whatever, you um, you appreciate and value those, you know, they're much more precious, right? Yeah. Because let's right. be honest, there was a time last March 
for like three, five, three, four, five, six days where we all thought this is totally over. And that's, that's such a, um, that's such a dark place to be in. I don't ever want to be in that place again. I mean, at the time I was doing a recording uh, and I think it comes out on the recording. The recordings I'm out yet. Um, I was recording the partitas at the time. And like, that was a very sad time in mm-hmm. life. Um, and, you know, and the, and the fact that we shared it collectively made it kind of worse. Uh, you know, you think, well, after that, nothing is as bad, is it? And I think then maybe you think, now I will do good. Now I will, now I will do the right things. You know, now I will spend my time doing the things that have meaning to me. Mm-hmm. Now I'll try extra special hard to do a good job for that one person yeah. in the whole who actually might get everything that I'm saying, you know? Um, now is the time to do it for others. Hey, I gotta say, you know, when you're early career or early mid career as I am, I guess, um, you know, it's very easy to forget others. It's very easy to forget um, that we're in this together. And so, you know, that was a good reminder to me. Um, you know, I think the wrong response to this would be um, to use it as a platform to just kind of get yourself more notoriety. Um, I was watching a um, video. I mean, like everybody, I've been watching more YouTube. And there was a lecture by Camille Paglia, who is super interesting. Um, you know, she wrote, what is it? Um, Human Sexualities, I guess was her big book. And Camille Paleo was saying that basically like if you pose as avant-garde just to get more social media followers, but you don't suffer for it, you're not avant-garde. Like you're just a, you're just a self-server. Like if for being yourself, you suffer and you take it in the neck. Yeah, that's being different and that's being unique. And so I think maybe this is a time to decide who you want to be. Who do you want to be? Mm. Who do you want to be? What do you live for? By the way, and if it's for self-promotion, if, and if it's for, uh, you know, and if it's for not questioning some of the very problematic, um, problematic structures that our industry is based on, then that's fine. Just be honest with yourself. Right. Um, but yeah, the, the, that questioning. And I, and I wonder if there's maybe some younger people watching this and thinking, how the heck do I get into this business at such a her- terrible time? There's really yeah. no easy way. Like you're going to, you're going to have to, you're, you're going to have to, if anything, question more. It never gets easier. The, the, the musician, the artist who stops questioning themselves stops growing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I like what you say about really particularly questioning yourself and this sort of con context of, of community, of otherness, of what, yeah. I think those are really great points. It's, n- it's not too late. It's not, hey, if it yeah. wasn't too late for me, it's not too late. So, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Mahan, thank you so much for, for making time thank to you. this chat. And it was it was really great to hear hear your thoughts and a bit of your journey. Um, I would just ask you one, one last question, which is sort sure. of, Hence the title of the show, something. Um, how and when do you feel music can be revolutionary? When can music be revolutionary? Well, revolution is such a loaded term, isn't it? Um, oops, hello. Here we are. <laughs> What's revolutionary is that I was able to get through a Zoom with only dropping my iPad like once. That is revolutionary. No, um, I think. You know, if, to paraphrase, Gustav Leonhardt, who's a harpsichordist, said that if you start out by trying to, be, to, trying to be authentic, you'll never be convincing. But if you're convincing, then you'll always be authentic. And, you know, if you set out to be revolutionary, you're just a, you're just a schmuck. Like, what, like, that's not revolutionary. Like, you're just trying hard. You know, it's like, where was I before the lockdown? I was in um, Stoke Newington and I saw someone on a penny farthing bike and I was like, come, come on. I mean, you're in Berlin, right? You must see that. Yes. 
And yeah. like, that's like, you're not cool. Like, that's not cool. But you know who's cool? Who's cool? Cool is like, I, um, I have, because of canceled concerts, I've been studying Latin again, which I haven't done since high school, which has been really interesting. And it's been an intensive course. By the way, that's not cool. I'm not cool for doing that. <laughs> but um, but uh, there's this guy whose videos I've been watching online who's like obsessed with Latin pronunciation and all the different like change of the phonology of Latin. And, and like, that's super cool. Like this guy is just authentic to himself. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. he's a big nerdy, American guy who's just really into Latin phonology and he makes YouTube videos about it. And, you know, I think, I think he found something that communicate that can communicate to other people. And I don't know if that's re revolutionary, but he is who he is. You know, I don't know, man. I mean, it's one of those things like they said to, um, they said to the Chinese premier Cho and Lai, they said, what do you think are the effects of the Ch French Revolution? By the way, they asked them. They asked him this in the 1970s, and they okay. said, "What are the effects of the French Revolution?" And he said, mm, "Too early to tell." You know, like I don't know. You know, you, you don't know what's revolutionary. Yeah. yeah. You know, but I'm writing right now a, a hopefully a book proposal about a work of Bach's, which I can't say what it is yet. But Bach does things in this work that are indeed revolutionary there's no other word for it but you know could it be the benefit afforded by 250 years of hindsight where we are able to see that Bach's method of revolution is a is a very quiet and is a very soft-spoken you know Bach doesn't you know he doesn't sort of take a hammer to the form and destroy it he has much more subtle ways of being revolutionary um so you know everybody has their you know not everyone's Che Guevara some people are Václav Havel some people are um you know, some people are Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? Like some people are, um, you know, uh, I don't know, different different kinds of people. So um, some people are an Ira Bevan or Nicola Sturgeon or whatever. You know, like they're each person might be revolutionary in their in their own way. You know, we have and we have to find a world in which we find, uh, you know, we find space for that. Yep. Love it. Yeah. I, I notice every time I finish a sentence, I go, you know, kind of like. Uh, 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 I don't know. <laughs> that's yeah, also that's, good. That's, that's a my good stance. Yes. <laughs> Mahan, thank you so much for, for this and for sure. making time and wishing that you um, stay well and that our paths yes. maybe cross sometime. Yeah, for sure. You know, just stay stay positive and test negative and, you know, <laughs> we'll get out of this. We'll get know. out of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, all so, right. Well, Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for tuning in and see you next week.